Hi everyone. In this lesson, we are talking about the signs and symptoms, nutrient deficiencies, and complications that can occur from a tapeworm infection. Now, before we get into the signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection, let's talk about what tapeworms are. Tapeworms are also known as flatworms, and the reason that they are called flatworms is because they are flat in appearance. They can actually look like a piece of tape or a measuring tape. Now, they are parasites of the class cestoda, and they can often be referred to as cestodes because of this. Now, there are many different species of tapeworms, but the species we're going to talk about in this lesson have humans as a primary host, and each species has a different intermediate host, and we'll briefly talk about that here in this lesson. And most often, humans are infected by tapeworms through the consumption of undercooked or uncooked meat products, and they can also be infected by ingestion of a contaminated or infected flea from a cat or a dog, which can occur with one particular species we'll talk about here in the next slide. So tapeworm species actually vary across the world, with some species being more common in certain areas of the world than others. For instance, the tapeworm Hymenolepis nana is the most common infection in the United States, whereas Tania saginata is more common in Europe, South America, Africa, and Asia. And tapeworms can be important causes of nutrient deficiencies, which we will talk about later on in this lesson. Now, as we mentioned before, there are a variety of tapeworm species, but we're going to talk about a particular group of species that are more common in humans. So the signs and symptoms and complications we're going to talk about in this lesson are going to come from these particular species. Tania solium, Tania saginata, Diphylobothrium latum, Hymenolepis nana, and Dipylidium caninum. Now, an infection with either of these Tania species is going to lead to a condition known as Taniasis. Tania solium is going to be also known as the pork tapeworm. It's going to come from uncooked or undercooked pork products. Tania saginata is going to come from beef. It's going to be considered the beef tapeworm. It's going to come from uncooked or undercooked beef products. Diphylobothrium latum is the fish tapeworm. It's going to come from uncooked or undercooked fish. An infection with this particular tapeworm is going to lead to diphylobothriasis. Infection with Hymenolepis nana is going to occur from person to person, so there's often not going to be an intermediate host with this particular tapeworm. And an infection with this tapeworm is going to lead to what is known as hymenolepiasis. An infection with Dipylidium caninum in humans is going to come from ingestion of fleas that have been infected themselves with tapeworms from cats and dogs. So this is going to lead to the condition known as dipylidiasis. So because there are multiple species of tapeworms and multiple medical conditions that result from them, there is going to be a variety of signs and symptoms that may occur, but for the most part, the majority of symptoms are going to overlap with each of these tapeworms. So as I go through the signs and symptoms, most of them are going to be applicable to all of these tapeworms, but I will mention specific details if a particular sign and symptom occurs more commonly with a particular tapeworm infection. Now let's talk about the signs and symptoms of having a tapeworm. So having a tapeworm may actually lead to no symptoms at all. It may be asymptomatic, especially in adult patients, it's going to be asymptomatic or very mild, very few mild signs and symptoms. But in children, signs and symptoms are oftentimes going to be more likely to be present and more likely to be severe. So we will talk about those specific details as we go on through these signs and symptoms. So having said that, if a patient does have signs and symptoms, what might some of those signs and symptoms be? So some of them include passage of proglottids. Now this is actually going to be one of the more common findings with patients who have tapeworms. So proglottids are these little pieces of tapeworm that get passed in the stool of an infected person. So they often can be described as something that's white or a little piece of rice in the stool. So this can often be something that can be noted in patients with a tapeworm infection. And it may lead to slight discomfort as well. And then another common finding with patients who have tapeworm infections is abdominal pain. Now this abdominal pain may be colicky or crampy. It can be a pain that may come and go. It may be vague. Colicky pain is going to be more common in children. And some patients may describe having an epigastric pain, epigastric pain being above the belly button in the middle or center of the abdomen, or in and around the periembolical area, so in and around the belly button. Interestingly, this abdominal pain is more likely to occur in the morning. So when a patient wakes up early morning, they're more likely to have this type of pain. And this pain is often characteristically relieved with eating small amounts of food. So those are 
two important and interesting characteristics with regards to the abdominal pain with a tapeworm infection. Another important symptom of a tapeworm infection is anal pruritus or anal itching and irritation. This can be a cause of pruritus ani, and it's due to the irritation and passage of proglottids in the stool. So this can often be another important finding in patients with tapeworms. Patients can also have nausea. Again, interestingly, this nausea is more likely to occur in the morning, and it is often relieved or may be relieved with eating small amounts of food. So again, this is another interesting characteristic with regards to this nausea, and this goes along with that abdominal pain we talked about before. So again, the abdominal pain and the nausea are more likely to occur in the morning and could be relieved with eating small amounts of food. This may be very important in realizing that a patient may have an issue with a tapeworm infection. Patients can also have issues with vomiting, although this is going to be more rare. It's oftentimes only going to occur in small infants. And as we mentioned before, infants are going to often present with more severe clinical features. There can also be bowel habit changes. This can either be diarrhea and or constipation. Infants or young children are more likely to be affected with diarrhea, although overall, diarrhea and constipation are going to be more rare findings with a tapeworm infection. But out of all of the tapeworm infections, diarrhea is going to be more likely to occur in hymenolepiasis, so that infection with hymenolepis nana, which is again the most common tapeworm infection in the United States. Tapeworm infections can also lead to changes in appetite as well. This can either be an increase or decrease in appetite, so it can be either one. And there can also be weight loss as well. Weight loss is going to often occur from malabsorption. So because of the tapeworm or if there are multiple tapeworms, each of them are absorbing nutrients. So they're taking away nutrients from the patient. So there can be issues with getting enough nutrition. And this may also be compounded by a possible decrease in appetite. So both of these may lead to a weight loss as well. Some other signs and symptoms of a tapeworm infection may include a fever. So fevers are going to more likely occur in infant patients. And again, this is due to an infection. So it's an infection with a tapeworm within the gastrointestinal tract. This is not likely to occur in adult patients. Adults are not likely to mount a fever against a tapeworm infection, but they could. Again, this is going to be more likely to occur in infant patients. Malaise may also occur in some patients. So malaise is a feeling of generally being unwell. And again, this may be due to nutrient deficiencies and or the tapeworm infection in general. And then weakness may also occur in some patients. Again, this is going to be due to nutrient deficiencies. So again, we're going to talk about the vitamin that is going to be more likely to be deficient from a tapeworm infection later on in this lesson when we talk about nutrient deficiencies. So some other signs and symptoms from a tapeworm infection include irritability. Irritability is more likely to occur in children, and the irritability is more likely to occur in taniasis and diploidiasis, so infections with the tania species or dipylidium caninum. Headaches may occur as well, but this is more likely to be a rare finding. It can occur in taniasis, and it may occur in a very important complication we're going to talk about later on in this lesson, which is cystocercosis, or in this case, neurocystocercosis. We will talk about this later on in this lesson. And pruritus and a rash may also occur in some cases of a tapeworm infection. Pruritus is, again, an itching sensation. So a rash may develop, and a patient may feel itchy in different parts of their body. This is going to occur in the case of dipylidiasis. So dipylidium caninum infections are more likely to cause pruritus and a rash. And the reason that this pruritus and rash occurs is due to an allergic reaction to that particular species of tapeworm, dipylidium caninum. In some patients, there can also be nasopruritus as well. So the patient's nose can be itchy too. So this is going to be something that may be noted in infections with particularly this tapeworm dipylidium caninum. Now let's talk about nutrient deficiencies that can occur in tapeworm infections. And by far the most important nutrient deficiency that can occur is a vitamin B12 deficiency. So vitamin B12 deficiencies can occur from an infection with diphylobothrium latum, known as the fish tapeworm. It comes from uncooked or undercooked fish. So this particular tapeworm is the one that is going to be the culprit in causing a vitamin B12 deficiency, especially if a patient has had this tapeworm for a very long period of time, or if the tapeworm itself is very large. So this particular species can lead to a vitamin B12 deficiency. And because there is a vitamin B12 deficiency, there can be signs and symptoms of a vitamin B12 deficiency, including certain neurological findings, including symmetric paresthesias. So 
numbness and tingling sensations symmetrically. So if it's on one leg, it's going to be also occurring on the other leg as well. The patient may also have a shuffling gait, so they may have problems with their balance while they're walking. They can also have certain psychological symptoms, including depression and irritability. So vitamin B12 deficiency from this particular tapeworm is going to be very important in recognizing and identifying. And a vitamin B12 deficiency can also lead to anemia as well, which will also cause other symptoms to occur. And then overall malnutrition can occur from a tapeworm infection. This malnutrition is more likely to occur in young children, and it's more likely to occur with large tapeworm burdens. So if there are many, many different tapeworms in the infected patient, that's going to more likely cause malnutrition. Each of those tapeworms is going to absorb nutrients from the gastrointestinal tract, and that's going to prevent the patient from getting access to those nutrients. So again, the tapeworm itself is absorbing and stealing the nutrients from the patient. And now let's talk about the complications from having a tapeworm infection. There are several different important complications to learn about from a tapeworm infection. One of the most important ones is going to be appendicitis. So appendicitis is an inflammation of the appendix. This is actually going to be the most common serious complication of having a tapeworm infection. This is caused by obstruction from cystocerci. These tapeworms become lodged in and around the appendix leading to a blockage of the appendix and subsequent inflammation and enlargement of that appendix leading to appendicitis. So this can occur from infections with many different tapeworm species, especially those tania species we talked about before. And then obstruction can also occur as well. So obstruction of multiple ducts within the gastrointestinal system. So we'll talk about those here in a moment. So obstruction of the pancreatic and bile ducts may occur in rare cases. And the intestine itself may be obstructed. There may be some small bowel obstruction that may occur, but this is, again, a very rare complication. And this is also going to occur from obstruction by cystocerci. So if there's a very large tapeworm burden, they can lead to obstruction of particular ducts, and even the intestinal lumen can be obstructed. So those are some other important complications that can occur as well. And another very important complication that can occur that is caused by a particular species of tapeworm is cystic sarcosis and neurocystic sarcosis. So cystic sarcosis and neurocystic sarcosis is going to be caused by tania solium. So tania solium is the pork tapeworm that comes from consumption of uncooked or undercooked pork. This particular complication though is going to be not from consuming uncooked or undercooked pork, it's actually going to be from an infection from another human tapeworm carrier. So a human that is infected with tania solium that is passing those proglottids and eggs in their stool, or the patient themselves is infected with a tania solium tapeworm that is also passing proglottids and eggs in their stool. If that patient were to be exposed to those eggs or ingest those eggs through fecal oral transmission, cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis may occur in that patient. So what happens here briefly is that the stage of this tapeworm can pass through the gastrointestinal mucosa, enter into the bloodstream, and be carried to different parts of the body, including some organs like the liver. So there can be cysts in the liver as well and other organ systems as well. In that case, that would be considered cystic sarcosis. Oftentimes the patient's immune system can clear those cysts. So that won't be an issue. But in some cases, those cysts can enter into the brain where the immune system does not take care of them. So the patient has these cysts within the brain that would be considered neurocystocercosis, and that is going to lead to particular signs and symptoms, including convulsions or epilepsy, dizziness, stroke, and headache as well. And the reason I bring this up is because this is actually going to be the most common cause of acquired epilepsy. So this is going to be very important topic to better understand. I'm going to actually have another lesson on tapeworm infections and cystocercosis and neurocystocercosis where I talk about this in more detail. So please check out my lesson for more information. I hope you found this lesson helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more lessons like this one. And as always, thanks so much for watching and hope to see you next time.